here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to pray uh, again really quickly uh, just over me and over my mind and, and over this moment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Lord, uh, I uh, submit myself to you. I am a vessel to be used. Um, your word is holy. Your word is precious. And a preacher has that strange balancing act to, to, to read your word, to teach it, to add some context, but not to add personal opinion or anything like that that might take away from your word. Your word has the power all on its own. So I pray that all preparation and study and anything and everything that I say would not get in the way of what you want to say to hearts today. Would you use me and would you use every person in this room for the, the, the giving of the word of God is not just from the preacher to the hearer, but we're all a part of that. So Lord, by your spirit, would you work in every heart and speak. Be with us this morning as you've already been. I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. 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 I'm going to give you a quick review just in case you forget where we were. We've been literally looking at two chapters. That's it, Exodus chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 3. And we've taken now four weeks to get there, get through it. So we started back in uh, April ish, I think, is where we started. And the very first message was from Exodus chapter 2, and it was this message of preparation. And I don't know if you remember, but I challenge you that God is at work behind the scenes. And when we read Exodus chapter 2, we saw these ordinary stories of an ordinary family and an ordinary child that went through a lot of weird things that they didn't really understand. And as we read it, we realized, oh, God's trying to do something in a group of people, and he's actually at work behind the scenes. And I challenged each of us and myself that there were things that happen in our lives sometimes really, really ordinary. And then sometimes there are some weird things that happen in your life that you don't really understand what's going on or why it happened. And I challenge you, perhaps it's because God's actually at work behind the scenes. There's something that he wants to do, and he's using some situation that we don't understand to make sure that comes to pass. The next week, uh, we talked about appearance. And so uh, it's 40 years later, and I challenge you that God starts to draw our attention toward him. And it's this, this story where, where Moses is, is, is working with his, his animals, his sheep, and he's on this mountain that I would guess that he'd been before. I can't imagine in 40 years you, he'd never seen that mountain before. I bet you he'd been there before, once, twice, ten times, who knows, lots of times. But something was different this particular time. There's a bush that's on fire that's not being consumed. And I think it's God trying to get this man's attention. And so... Moses turns his attention. He goes to see that bush, and God starts to speak to him from that bush. In fact, something unique happens. God says, hey, take your, your sandals off. Where you're standing was on holy ground. Why didn't he take his sandals off when he got there? Because it wasn't holy ground without the presence of God. But the presence of God was there. He's got Moses' attention. He says, hey, things change when I'm present. And that got us, I think that was just two verses in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, the last time I was here, which was June, we were in part 3. We looked at Exodus chapter 3. We looked at verse 5 through verse 10. And I suggested we were looking at an assignment. God starts to bring about a new perspective when he's trying to bring something new to be done. Uh, a lot of times we can get lost in our old way of thinking, an old way of uh, operating. We just get lost in normal. And in order for God to bring about some change, he's got to change some sort of perspective. And when your perspective changes, then all of a sudden the way you see things and the way you operate starts to change. And we see that in, in Moses. Um, for some reason, God did not raise up a deliverer in the midst of the people that were suffering. He got Moses out of there, changed his perspective, and then he's going to send him back to do something. And that's kind of where we left off. Um, in verse 10, God had just, or yeah, verse 10, God had just told Moses that God has seen his people, the Hebrews, and that um, what, they, what they're going through is difficult, and God's about to snatch them out of it. He's going to snatch them out because they're not going to walk out on their own. Right? Um, God has now designated an outsider to go in and to deliver the people that were oppressed. Because 
th this situation of the oppressed and the oppressor had become normalized. They didn't even see it again. And there are times in our lives where things just become normalized. It was normal to be uh, oppressed to the Hebrews. They didn't even question it anymore. It was normal. It was normal for this oppression for the Egyptian leadership. It was at this point, they had grown up in this. This is all they knew. It's 400 years. It's all they knew. It was normal for the, the Hebrew just constituents, just the people who lived there. This situation with the Hebrews, that was normal. It's been 400 years. That's all they know. It has been normal. I'm going to make it uh, really relevant, kind of bring it, bring it close to home, at least where we are as a nation, as a culture. In our nation, before I was born, I was, I'm born in the 70s, segregation was normal. It was just normal. Um, slavery had been deemed to be wrong, unconstitutional, um, and it was abolished, but segregation became the law. And again, I, I didn't grow up in that. I'm born in the 70s, but I was uh, about a month, two months ago, we went to the Civil Rights Museum down in Birmingham, Alabama, and walked through. They've got all these you know, pictures, and they've got artifacts, and they've got newspaper clippings, and you see it. Their restaurants were segregated. Um, social um, places, uh, theaters, and things like that, they were segregated, white and colored, and, and I, I can't even conceive of that. But there was a time where it just happened. It was normal. And, it, you know, it, it, it just happened. It became policy. In fact, schools were segregated, and it was a huge deal when schools started to become desegregated. In my part of the world where I'm living right now, uh, we hear about the Clinton 12. Before I moved to Tennessee, knew nothing about it. And the Oak Ridge or Scarborough 85. And historically, what, what they say is Oak Ridge High School was the first high school to be desegregated, in Tennessee at least. And so there's monuments, and Clinton uh, 12 has a, has a whole museum because it was a huge deal to desegregate schools. Doesn't make sense to me, but it made sense to them because segregation was normal. It was normalized. Um, when things are normal, there are some wrongs that we don't even realize are wrong because it's just normal. It's just the way we do it. That was Israel in Egypt. What had happened, the way of life was just normal. They had come a way long way from the days of Joseph. If you know the story of Joseph, when Joseph brought his family, he was favored for the Hebrews. Hundreds of years later, who's Joseph? <laughs> the way we operate. So God gives Moses an assignment, and I want you to understand the gravity of, of the assignment. I want you, Moses, to go to the leader of the nation, the commander of chief, in chief of a big army, strong army, a government leader with power and economic status and all these things. I want you to tell him that you're going to disrupt his entire economic and governmental system. That's what Moses was told. We, we spiritualize when we, when we read it. We kind of make it sound pretty, but that's what Moses was told. He says to Moses, tell him you're going to disrupt the rule of law. You're going to disrupt every way that they operate and function. And, and you're going to go, go, I want you to go to Pharaoh. Let him know you're going to do that. How, how do you think Moses felt about that? Bring it back uh, to, to the United States. United States, uh, the Jim Crow era lasted roughly a century, roughly a hundred years. So you're looking at post Civil uh, Civil War era to the mid 50s, 60s, kind of. That's the Jim Crow era. That, that's kind of what that was. Could you imagine God showing up to Moses in 1930, 40, and saying, "Hey, Moses." Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the White House. I want you to tell the President of the United States that you're going to take all the black people out of the country and take them all down there to uh, Mexico. It's kind of what Moses heard. Right? How does that happen? And to add insult to injury, God gives him a timeline. He says, I want you to do that now. 
Go now. There, there's, there's no you know, negotiation. There's no uh, diplomatic process. There's no, we're not going to bring it to, like, to, to Congress to, to debate the issue. I just want you to go and tell the president that, that you're going to take. <sighs> you see the challenge that Baltus probably had to face when that voice from the bush said, hey, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. That's where we pick up in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. So if you look along with me, we'll, we'll work this a bit. Verse 10, God speaking. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So Moses is going to respond in a way that's pretty reasonable. Because he's hearing those words and he's thinking, Pharaoh is pretty powerful. I'm pretty not. <laughs> Verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So the Lord said, I will certainly be with you. I'm going to pause for a moment. I don't know if you noticed that in verse 11 and verse 12, but the emphasis is on the I. In fact, the name of this sermon is Wrestling with the I. The emphasis here in the language is on the I. Moses looks at the I that he's used to working with. There's an I that Moses typically works with, and I bet you it's the same I that you are used to working with. Moses' question, who am I, that I should go, is not just why me, send somebody else. It's not just that, but he's asking, who am I? Not just why me, but who am I? That's Pharaoh, this is me. Who am I to go to him? We can regularly be deterred by the I. Has the I ever messed you up? I meant to bring a mirror, but I'm here by myself. I, re I remember my camera. I remember my Bible. I remember my notes. And I said, I need to bring me a mirror. So pretend I have a mirror. When you look in that mirror, you see the eye. You hold up the eye to see if the eye looks good. Any, any of you looked at a mirror this morning? Make sure you look good. Nobody? Nobody? Raise your hand if you looked at them. Come on. You check, make sure you're good. Yeah, all right. I know you can't just be that beautiful when you wake up. I'm sure it's not work. We, we look in that mirror and we see the eye, and that's a lot of times, if we're not careful, that's where we start, if we're honest. We look at the eye. How do I look? What can I do? What do I have? How can I, you know, can I do this? Have I done this before? Do I have the skill? Can I say that? You know, do I have the ability? Have I failed there before? We look at the eye. And many of us, I know I'm like this, that's my default. The moment God shows up to, to challenge me or push me to do something, my default is I look at the eye. And it's muscle memory. I don't do it on purpose. Like, I know I want to rely on God, but my, my knee-jerk reaction, mirror, I. Um, any of you ever jump in a car to drive somewhere and you end up driving somewhere different by mistake? Yeah. Ever happen to you? Yes. Uh, I, a uh, couple of weeks ago, I had to uh, cover the pulpit in Nashville. So I spoke at the Nashville Wesleyan Church. I haven't spoke there in well, a few months. I'll cover uh, for the pastor when he's on vacation or, or something like that. So I was scheduled to go. I jump in my car, pile my family in the car, got all my stuff, I'm ready. I jump in there, hit the gas, and I start heading south. I start heading to I-75 south. And at some point I realized, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to Nashville. Nashville, I have to head north to get to 40 so I can go west to get out to Nashville. You know where I was headed? Here. <laughs> Because I'm used to, when I'm going out to speak, I'm usually coming here. And I head to I 75 and head south. It's just so I, I caught myself within 10 minutes and I turned around and, you know, it's muscle memory. Some things are just knee jerk. We just, anybody ever do that? Is that just me? Come on. That's the eye for us sometimes. God steps in. He's challenging us to do something. First thing we do, knee jerk. I, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Perhaps 
Moses is more like us than we want to admit. Who am I? He's looking at his own ability. But God's response, I don't know if you noticed it. God's response is this, and I want to encourage you. He says, hey, there's something different right now, Moses. Who am I? He says, no, there's something different now. No, no, there, there, Moses, there's, there's something different. If you, Moses, would have went to that Pharaoh a year ago, there would have been different. Your outcome would end up different. Moses, you tried to rescue your people 40 years ago. It didn't work out. You end up escaping because you got in trouble because uh, there's something different now. What's the difference? He says, verse 12, I will certainly be with you. When God is with you, things are different. When you do things just based on the I, things don't always work out that well. You might luck out and maybe something, but it doesn't really work out that well when you're just working with the I. But he says, no, no, I will be with you. Moses, things are different. My brother, my sister, I want to remind us, when God is with us, things are different. There are things that God asks us or requests us or demands of us to do that when we look at the eye, it's impossible. But when we look at who's with us, nothing is impossible with God. And God has to show him, no, 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 Moses, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the eye. Because I'm going to be with you. My brother, my sister, don't, don't worry about the eye. Because God is with you. And God reminds Moses, hey, God is with me. The tension is in the 2B statement. Moses looks at his own I am. And if you look at the, the, the kind of how the, the language is, you can't really maybe see it in English, but that there's a play on the word I am. I am. Moses looks at himself and he says, I, I, I'm insufficient. And God says, no, 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 but I am all sufficient. Amen? Amen. Moses looks at himself. He says, wait a minute, but I'm alone and I'm unable. And God says, no, 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 but I am going with you and I am more than able. There's a play on that I am. Moses says, well, but I am. And God says, no, no, but I am. And when you wrestle with your I, I am, I want you to remember the great I am. Amen? Amen? If we don't focus on the great I am, then every time an obstacle comes up, we'll fall back to relying or wrestling with our I. And the guy says, I don't want you to wrestle with your I. His plan is not dependent on your I. It's on his I. Amen? So verse 12. God says, I will certainly be with you, and this will be a sign to you that I sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, I say to him, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. They'll say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? That's a weird question. When they ask me for your name, what, what am I supposed to say? It's a weird question because we don't understand what Moses is actually asking. Moses is not asking like it for an introduction. He's not saying, you know, for example, hey, uh, when I come and visit your church, who should I see? Well, there's a guy at the door named so-and-so. Oh, hey, so like, That's not what he's asking. He's not asking for a name. The question has a lot to do with where the people are right now and what's going on in their lives. Egypt had gods. Each, in fact, every culture all throughout history has had gods. It's a relatively new phenomenon now for people to think there is no God. Atheism is relatively new. It's contemporary. People all throughout history have believed in some sort of gods. They didn't know who that god was, but they believed there were. They looked around and they said, yeah, there are things that I can't explain humanly. There are things that are going on that are way bigger than this human. So uh, there must be a god that controls fire. There must be a god that controls the rain. There must be a god that controls fertility. There's got to be something more than me. So everybody had gods. And if you understand kind of history, 
their gods were territorial. So in Egypt, Egypt had gods for Egypt. In Midian, the Midianites had gods for Midian. All throughout, they had gods that were in charge of whatever was going on, whatever phenomenon in their area. So the name of the god wasn't a big deal. You can call the god anything, but that was the god of rain, harvest. The name wasn't the big deal. It was what was that God in control of. So the question that Moses is asking is not a question of identity, but it's, it's of reputation. It's of fame. It's of character. He's saying, how, how am I supposed to explain the character of you, God, that you can, from Midian, control what's happening in Egypt? They're going to ask me, God, and this is what his question is. They're going to ask me, how is this God that you met in Midian have any kind of authority over what's happening with us in Egypt? So when he, when, when he says, God, they're going to ask me your name. It's not, hey, my name is Joe. It's, it's authority. It's character. It's how can your God that you met on some mountain in Midian have anything to do with what's going on with us in Egypt? That's the question. And if you notice, that's the question that God answers. God says to Moses in verse 14, I am that I am. He says, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So God doesn't give Moses a name. He said, tell him my name is Zach. <laughs> that's not what he does. His, 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 his answer is not identity, it's character. It's his, his, his fame, his reputation. He says, this is how I am to be known. And depending on your, your translation, this is what scholars and theologians call the tetragrammaton. Uh, this I am who I am, or I am that I am. Other translations, I will be who I will be. I am being that which I am being. But he told him. Uh, John Durham is a scholar. He says, I am the is in one. In other words, I am the one who always is. That's what God is. That's what he said. Do you, do, you get, do you get what the answer is? He says, when they ask you for my character, my reputation, I am the one that is. I am anything that needs to happen, anything that I need to be at any time, in any place. That's, that's who I am. Anything that I need to get done, anything that I need to maneuver, anything that needs to happen, that's, that's who I am. That's who I am. Any place that it needs to, to, to occur, that's who I am. That's where I am. That, that, that's who I am. Who, who's sending you? The one who always is in any situation, any way, that's who I am. Oh, how freeing is that? How encouraging is that, my brother and my sister? If God is the same now as he was then, and I believe he is same yesterday, today, and forever, then when you ask God for the impossible, he answers. He answers your prayer. Uh, in this situation, and in many situations, people have unspoken requests. You know why we can give unspoken requests? Because God already knows. God knows those requests when it's in your heart. He knows the request before you even utter the request. And he can meet the need before you even realize you have the need. God is. He is. He is able. He is powerful. He is faithful. He is holy. He is wonderful. He is great. He is. Sometimes we pray and we don't get the answers looking the way that we want them to look. And sometimes we can question, God, did you hear me? God, could you do it? God, why, why, why? And God's back there saying, of course I heard you. Of course I can do it. Why? Because I am. I know what you need even for you. <coughs> and he's working in your life. Don't give up on God. <coughs> Don't ever think that just because things are not looking the way you want that God has abandoned you. Oh, no. He's the God who is. 
I am that I am. He said, Moses, I, I'm not restricted to a place, a time, a situation. I am what I am. So when God said to Moses, I go to verse 15. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, comma, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all the generations. Go, gather the elders of Israel together, and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, comma, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and have seen what is done to you in Egypt. I have said I will bring you up out of the affliction of the Egypt of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you see all of God's I statements? There's no doubt in any of them. God did not say, hey, I'm going to try to deal with that slavery situation. He didn't say, hey, I hope I could probably bring you a little bit, maybe relief with what you're going through. He didn't say, hey, 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 if it kind of works out of all the cards are in order, then I can, I think I can get Pharaoh to change his mind. He said, no, no, I will visit you. I have heard. I have seen. I will deliver you. I said it uh, a couple of weeks ago. I said, um, what they were looking for is relief. They were under oppression. They just wanted some relief. God says, relief? I'm getting you out. When Moses shows up and says, hey, uh, this God that I talked to, Midian, he, he, taught, he sent me here to deliver you from the hand, to snatch you out of the hand of, of, of Pharaoh. And their brain, they're like, what? That's impossible. God says, no, no, I am. I'm going to do it. I've heard your prayer. I've seen you. I've heard your cries. I've come to do something about it. Bigger, better than you even imagine. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine. Amen? Amen. When he answers, his name is the I am, what he's saying is whatever the situation is that needs to be dealt with, I am. Whatever's going on in your life, I am. If you sit here in this room, and I hope nobody, but if you sit in this room and you, 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 have, you, have, you have beef with God, you're kind of distant from God, then what you've done is you've distanced yourself from the great I am. Anything that you actually need in your life, God, he can do it. And if you're distanced from him, I would suggest, I would strongly urge you, come to know him, repent, turn, get to know him, come close to him. He is the I am. And he's calling for you. God still does that today. Whether it's delivering a group of people, whether it's reviving a church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, whether it's bringing revival to a city or a state or a country or working in a family or moving you into some type of ministry or as a student in a classroom, he still is the I am. Jesus said this in, in, in Matthew chapter 20. He said, hey, there, go, therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have uh, commanded you, and surely I am with you always. That baptizing in all nations and teaching them stuff, yeah, that sounds impossible if you look at who I am. But he said, but I am with you always, which makes that thing possible. The great I am. I want to end with this thought. Don't lean on your own abilities or capabilities or skills or anything. Those are, those, are, those are good. Those are necessary. There are some things you've accomplished because God has built you up and poured those things in you and he's used you and there are some really good things that you can do and he'll use those. There are some places that you dropped the ball, you failed and God can use that too. 
But you don't lean on that. Your leaning is on him. The great I am. That's where your, your power comes. That's where your strength comes. That, that's where God does the impossible. It's when you lean on the great I am. Instead of wrestling with your I, align yourself with Jesus. It's his presence that's going to bring you into his will, his purpose, his plan. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. It's my wife's favorite verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean. That, that, that leaning is faith, by the way. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Not Mike. He can see if he can make it work. He's going to do it. He's the I am. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. You need the first to do the second, by the way. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. I don't know where you are today. Emotionally, mentally, just life. But sometimes it's healthy to just be reminded that he is the great I am. Mm -hmm. Moses looks and he says, Pharaoh, me, ah, uh, that game is not uh, fair. And God says, you're right, but you got the wrong opponent. It's Pharaoh, and it's me. And I'm going to be with you. I am the great I am. Would you bow and pray with me? Dear Lord, I don't, I don't know all the specifics of every situation in this room, but you do. Lord, I don't know why this message was placed on my heart six months ago, but you do. And Father, I don't know why the timing was such that on August 4th, 2024, this sermon is preached to this audience, but you do. If any of these people are like me, sometimes I, as a knee-jerk response, things happen, life goes on, someone asks something, opportunities open up, and I look at the mirror, and I'm looking at the I am. Me, instead of looking at the great I am, you. And if there's anyone in this room that you've been prodding or talking to or that's questioned or doubted or been hurt or sad or discouraged, Lord, would you remind them that you are the great I am, that there's nothing that you can't do when you need to do it, how you need to do it, where you need to do it, nothing you can't do. Nothing is impossible for you. And Lord, I thank you that we are Christians, people who are called by your name, who can lean on you and depend on you, and you give us direction and wisdom in all things. We are in partnership with the great I am. Remind us of, of that as we walk through this week, I pray. In Jesus' great, precious name.